The shape of a molecule determines many of its physical and chemical properties. By designing molecules of particular shapes, chemists can design molecules that are useful for a wide range of applications, ranging from diagnosing and treating disease to monitoring and cleaning up pollution. The overall goal of this presentation is to learn how to predict the shape or molecular geometry of a molecule from its Lewis structure. To do this, I will introduce you to valence shell electron pair repulsion, or VSEPR theory, which is a simple theory for predicting the shape of the molecules making up covalent compounds. The first step will be to understand how objects extending from a single central point will arrange themselves to minimize the crowding between them. The specific objects we will care about are called charge clouds representing the electron pairs in either bonds or lone pairs. The application of VSEPR is based on Lewis dot structures, so the examples I work will also provide as a review for drawing these structures. Valence shell electron pair repulsion, or VSEPR theory, predicts the shape of molecules, or molecular geometry. It applies to covalent compounds because these can form molecules, unlike ionic solids. It is based on the principle that the electron pairs around an atom repel each other. These electron pairs are in lone pairs and bonds. And these lone pairs and bonds want to spread out from each other as far as possible. The concept of charge clouds is central to VSEPR. A charge cloud is either a bond to another atom, or lone pair. To determine the number of charge clouds around a central atom, first count each connection to another atom as one. It does not matter if the connection is a single, double, or triple bond. Each connection counts only once. Next, count each lone pair once. The total of lone pairs and connections to other atoms is the number of charge clouds. Balloons can be used as a simple way to see how charge clouds arrange themselves in space. As with charge clouds, the balloons don't want to occupy the same region of space. For now, consider the balloons as the connections or bonds to atoms. I will return to lone pairs later. If I tie two balloons together, this represents a central atom located at a point where I tied them together, connected to two other atoms. This is a model of a molecule like carbon dioxide, or CO2, with a central carbon atom bonded to two oxygen atoms with no lone pairs. The balloons arrange themselves so as to form a line. If I try to push them closer together, the fact that they can't occupy the same region of space resists this. When I let go, they return to forming a line. The linear geometry is the lowest energy geometry. This is an example of two charge clouds, both being connections to atoms. There are no lone pairs on the carbon atom. The molecular geometry in this case is linear. There is a double bond between each carbon and oxygen, but each double bond counts only as one charge cloud. If I add another charge cloud and shake the balloons around so they can find their most stable arrangement, you can see that the balloons point to the corners of a triangle and all lie in the same plane. This geometry is called trigonal planar or planar triangular. This is a model of a molecule such as boron trifluoride or BF3. The central atom boron is at the point where the balloons are tied together, and each balloon represents a bond to one of the three fluorine atoms. There are no lone pairs on the central boron atom. There are three charge clouds, each a bond to a fluorine atom. The molecular geometry is planar triangular. If I add a fourth balloon, or charge cloud, I get a representation of a molecule such as CH4, also known as methane or natural gas. The balloons point to the corners of what is called a regular tetrahedron. A regular tetrahedron is a type of polyhedron 
which is a three-dimensional object that has flat faces and straight edges. The four faces of the tetrahedron are all equilateral triangles. This geometry of four balloons is called tetrahedral. As a model of methane, the central atom is carbon, and each balloon represents a bond to a hydrogen atom. There are four charge clouds around the carbon. All of them are bonds. There are no lone pairs. The molecular geometry is tetrahedral. Note that the Lewis structure makes the molecule methane look planar, but in reality it is a three-dimensional structure with the CH bonds each pointing to the corner of a tetrahedron. We have now seen three possible molecular geometries and examples of molecules adopting those geometries. They are summarized here. The central atom in each case has no lone pairs. This is not to say that there are no lone pairs in the entire Lewis structure. There are lone pairs in both boron trifluoride and carbon dioxide, but they are on the peripheral atoms, not the central atom. With no lone pairs, the number of charge clouds is the number of connections or bonds to other atoms. With four charge clouds, the geometry is tetrahedral. With three charge clouds, the geometry is trigonal planar, or planar triangular. With two charge clouds, the geometry is linear. We have not yet considered lone pairs. The important concept here is that the molecular shape or molecular geometry describes the arrangement of only the atoms. But the lone pairs are still important in determining this geometry. Lone pairs can be thought of as a cloud of electrons sticking out from the atom. To see the effect of lone pairs on the molecular geometry, consider three different molecules. Methane, CH4, ammonia, NH3, and water, H2O. We have already seen the Lewis structure of methane. The Lewis structure of ammonia has one lone pair. The Lewis structure of water has two lone pairs. Each of these molecules has four charge clouds, but differing numbers of lone pairs. As we have already seen, methane, with no lone pairs, is tetrahedral. In ammonia, one of the four peripheral atoms is replaced with a lone pair. To see the effect of this lone pair on the molecular geometry, I start with three green balloons, each representing a bond between nitrogen and hydrogen. The geometry of this alone is trigonal planar, but it does not count for the lone pair. If I add a lone pair as a yellow balloon, I now have four charge clouds, each pointing to the corners of a tetrahedron. This tilts the NH bonds out of a planar geometry. Considering now only the atoms and not the lone pair in determining the geometry, we see that we get the shape of a pyramid with a triangular base. This geometry of atoms is called a trigonal pyramid, or simply pyramidal. This pyramidal geometry appears similar to the tetrahedral geometry, but note that in the tetrahedral geometry, only peripheral atoms define the vertexes of the polygon, and it is a regular polygon with identical triangles on all four sides. In the pyramidal geometry, the central atom defines one of the vertexes, and the pyramid is not a regular polygon. In water, there are still four charge clouds, but now two of them are lone pairs. Showing the HOH skeleton with two green balloons might make one think that water is a linear molecule. If I add the lone pairs, again using yellow balloons, however, we can see that the lone pairs push the two OH bonds out of a linear arrangement and into a bent one. The molecular geometry is determined only by the position of the atoms, and it is termed bent. How do lone pairs affect the molecular geometry when there are only three or two charge clouds? Examples are ozone, O3, and carbon monoxide, CO. The Lewis structure of ozone shows that the central oxygen has two connections to atoms and one lone pair. There are three charge clouds, one of which is a lone pair. This is represented by two green balloons and one yellow balloon tied together. 
The lone pair bends the two green balloons out of an originally linear configuration, giving a bent molecular geometry. The same geometry we saw for the case of four charge clouds, two of which were lone pairs. Now turning to carbon monoxide. There is only two charge clouds around the carbon, and only one is a bond, the other is a lone pair. As there are only two atoms involved, the geometry is by definition linear. Two points make a line. The following table summarizes the molecular geometries predicted by VSEPR for various numbers of charge clouds dividing between connections to other atoms and lone pairs. Generating this table on your own by reasoning out the way in which charge clouds fill space is a strong testament to your understanding of VSEPR. Starting with four charge clouds, all bonds to other atoms, leaves us with zero lone pairs and the molecular geometry is tetrahedral. Again with four charge clouds, but this time only three bonds to other atoms, gives one lone pair and the molecular geometry is a trigonal pyramid, or simply pyramidal. If the four charge clouds are divided equally between two connections to other atoms and two lone pairs, the molecular geometry is bent. Moving to three charge clouds, all bonds to other atoms, leaves zero lone pairs and the molecular geometry is trigonal planar or planar triangular. For three charge clouds, two bonds to other atoms and one lone pair, the geometry is bent. With two charge clouds, both bonds to other atoms, leaving zero lone pairs, the geometry is linear. Finally, any time there is only one bond to another atom, as with two charge clouds, one of which being a lone pair, the molecular geometry is linear because there are only two atoms involved. Let's now apply VSEPR to predict the shape of a couple of molecules. First, phosphorus trichloride, or PCl3. Step one involves drawing the Lewis structure. This is relatively easily done by inspection. Referring to the periodic table, we see that phosphorus has five valence electrons, and so the dot structure looks as follows. Chlorine has seven valence electrons. Drawing the dot structure for each chlorine atom, The octet rule for each atom can be readily satisfied if each unpaired electron on the phosphorus atom pairs up with the single unpaired electron on a chlorine to form three bonds. We can check the Lewis structure by making sure it contains the proper number of valence electrons and that each atom satisfies the octet rule. The total number of valence electrons we have to work with is 5 from phosphorus, 3 times 7 for 21 from the chlorines for a total of 26. Counting the electrons in the Lewis structure, 2 for each lone pair and 2 for each bond gives 26 as expected. Now checking the octet rule. Counting by 2 around each atom and recognizing the bonds count 2 for both atoms they are bonded to shows that each atom satisfies the octet rule. Hence, the structure is valid. The Lewis structure shows that there are four charge clouds around the phosphorus, with one of them being a lone pair. The molecular geometry is a trigonal pyramid, or pyramidal. As another example, consider the carbonate ion, CO3, 2-. VSEPR does not help us understand how the ions within an ionic solid are arranged relative to one another because it applies to atoms held together by covalent bonds rather than ionic bonds. The carbonate anion is a polyatomic ion consisting of atoms covalently bound together, so we can use VSEPR to predict its shape as an ion, but we cannot use VSEPR to describe its organization with other ions in forming an ionic solid. Again, we start with a Lewis structure and proceed in a somewhat more systematic way. First, I count the total number of valence electrons. 
referring to the periodic table, there's four for carbon and six each for oxygen, giving a total of 22 electrons. The negative two charge on the ion adds another two electrons, so there's a grand total of 24 valence electrons available. To determine the number of bonds needed to satisfy the octet rule, I calculate a hypothetical number. The number of electrons that would be needed for all of the atoms to satisfy the octet rule if they didn't have to share any. This is just eight times the number of atoms. There are four atoms, each would ideally like to have eight electrons. So by the octet rule, 32 electrons are needed if none were to be shared. We only have 24, so 32 minus 24 equals eight electrons need to be shared. Electrons are shared in bonds. As there are two electrons per bond, there will need to be eight divided by two or four bonds. As we have 24 valence electrons to work with, we also know that we will have 24 minus eight, the number of electrons in bonds, equals 16 electrons in lone pairs, or eight lone pairs. We are now ready to draw the Lewis structure. More electronegative atoms in a compound tend to lie on the periphery where they form fewer bonds. That way they don't have to share as many electrons. It makes sense then to guess that the carbon is the central atom surrounded by oxygen atoms. A single bond to each requires only three bonds, but we expect four, so there must be one double bond. This now satisfies the octet of carbon. We add lone pairs to the oxygen atoms to satisfy their octets. As we anticipated, this requires eight lone pairs, three around the two singly bonded oxygens and two around the doubly bonded oxygen. With this, we can now predict the shape of the carbonate anion. Note that we only predict the shape describing the arrangement of atoms around the central carbon atom. There are three charge clouds around the central carbon from two single bonds and one double bond. There are no lone pairs. These can minimize their overlap by pointing to the corners of a triangle, resulting in a trigonal planar or planar triangular geometry. In summary, Thea CPR is a simple theory for predicting the shape of molecules based on their Lewis structures. You understand Thea CPR if you can reason through this table we developed earlier by simply thinking about how objects such as balloons fill space.